Luke chapter 14, and uh, I will take a reading of verse 15, Luke 14, 15. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to them, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask that you have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. And still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. May God's rich blessings be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow. Father, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word brings light and illumination to our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits. And we want to be illuminated this morning. We want to have a greater understanding of what you have to say to us. Speak a good word to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room in the Father's kingdom. Plenty good room, plenty good room, just choose your seat and sit down. Anybody know that? My mom used to sing that to me when I was a boy. That's one of the old Negro spirituals. There's plenty of room. Plenty of room, plenty of good room in the Father's kingdom. Plenty of room, plenty of good room, just choose your seat and sit down. A lot of people are going to different places. And they're responding to invitations to come. And many of you get invited to big parties and banquets and uh, big events, and they will send you a very beautiful invitation with an RSVP. And that means you're supposed to let them know if you're coming or not. So they'll know whether or not to put another piece of chicken in the pot, uh, another potato in the oven bake some more bread so they have enough food just in case you come. And some of you have had events and you've had parties and you've invited people and they say that they were going to come. And then you made all the fixes, you got all things ready for them to come and they don't show up. And not only do they not show up, they don't even call, they don't even respond let you know they're, you're not coming. That's enough to make a man or woman lose their religion just right there. Then labored over this stove, then cooked all this food, then perspired and cleaned up the house, and you didn't show up. I was at an event uh, just last week that a good friend of mine had convened, and he had sent all of these invitations. And he must have had food for 50 or 60 people at least. And only a handful of people showed up. Now, the food was very good, was it not, Brother Tom Tolliver? It was very good, and, and to be honest with you, I, I was kind of glad a few people didn't come because they had that grilled chicken just like I like it, marinated just like the way I like it, and the baked potatoes, they were just right, and they had, it tastes like fresh cooked bread, and they had chocolate cake, which I shouldn't eat, but I'd eat a big piece, I ate a small piece. It, it was a pretty fine meal, but I just, as I sat there and I ate that, I said, why would the people not come? I mean, he had spent good money, legal tender, that I know that he cannot afford to waste. He invited all these people, and many of us, many of them are our friends. 
and they didn't come. And I thought about that, and he went and did a, get a, get a, get a, get a great program with a lot of energy and a lot of passion, and that's the way you're supposed to do it because you never, ever disappoint the people by giving less than your best effort who showed up while you're arguing with people who didn't show up. And so he gave a great program for those of us who showed up. But I couldn't help but to think, this is a lot the way it is going to be in heaven. A whole lot of people have been invited to come and participate in this great grand banquet, this ma marriage supper of the Lamb. And even today, I I'm amazed at the number of people that I talk to during the week, and I invite them to come to church. And they said, Reverend, I'm coming. I will be there. And I've started to say to most people the same things I used to say to some of my friends around about my age, a little bit older, when I invite them to come to church. And I've shared this with you before. And they said, Reverend, I'm coming. I said, I know you're coming. I just want you to walk in. I don't want them to wheel you in. I want you to come of your own power and your own energy so you can know what's going on and not to be the one we're all talking about. But in this day and age that people are in a hurry doing a lot of different things, a lot of people just don't have time to pause to give God time, to really prioritize their worship, prioritize prayer and fellowship of the saints. And a lot of people all over the country no longer feel that church attendance and church going is really that important or something they should be that concerned about. And so we shouldn't feel too bad about it. We shouldn't take it personal. But us, y'all shouldn't take it personal, thinking that y'all don't smile enough. The greeters, y'all shouldn't take it personal, feeling like y'all not hospitable enough. The choir, y'all shouldn't take it personal, thinking that y'all don't sing well enough. And I sure not going to take it personal, <laughs> because I'm doing the very best that I can do at this age that I'm at now with the energy I have left. We shouldn't take it personal. As a matter of fact, we should realize that we're in pretty good company because the great, greatest preacher, the greatest teacher that this world has ever known, Jesus of Nazareth, he had a tough time holding on to, to his congregation once all the fish and chips had been eaten. He had a tough time holding on to the congregation when he was no longer dispensing medication and performing miracles. There's something about uh, the human psyche that we kind of fickle when it comes to doing these things that are not mandatory. I was inviting some young people to come to church on Sunday, and they were telling me um, how hard it was for them to get up on Sunday morning. And I just couldn't get it, and so I kept pressing them about, you know, why they couldn't come to church on Sunday. They can get up all the rest of during the week and be over where they need to be, and they gave me a whole bunch of excuses as to why they, sh they can't get up on Sunday morning. And as I thought about that, I said, well, you know what? Really, Sunday morning is really the only day that you don't get penalized. If you don't, if you don't work on Sunday, if you, if you don't get up during the week, you're going to get penalized. You're going to lose your job. You're going to get docked at school. As a matter of fact, with the new rules they got in the Kanoa County School, you and your mom and your daddy could end up in court for truants if you miss so many days out of school. If you don't go to work, you can lose your job. So you penalize on the week so you're able to rise up. On Saturday, for many of us, we got to get up because the grass got to be cut eventually. The clothes got to be washed because most of us don't have a maid to come in to do it for us. And, uh, you know, the house got to be tied up just a bit if we do nothing else but move the clutter from this side to that side to make a walkway so we can get through. So we got to get up and get something done on Saturday. So when Sunday rolls around, there's no penalty for not, for not getting up on Sunday. If you don't get up on Sunday morning and God is not going to, He's not going to turn off the, the sunshine that shines on your house. If you don't get up on Sunday morning, God is not going to uh, cause the rain to not rain on your yard when it rains. I mean, God going to keep on blessing us whether we get up on Sunday morning or not. So we get accustomed to realizing there's no real penalty for me not to get up on Sunday morning and go to church. So I think I just won't do it. Well, we fail to realize that very often we are forfeiting something that we don't even realize we're forfeiting. We don't know what blessing God might have in store for us if we show up where God has show, told us to be. We don't know what insight God might have for us. We no, may not know how God might give us a breakthrough in our area. We don't even know how God might be equipping us to serve him 
in a more responsible way in the future. But because we don't show up where we're supposed to be, we miss out on what God has for us. Can I get a witness in the house? So y'all are here. Thank God that you're here because God has reserved something that you're going to get to gay that those who could have been here and are not here won't get. So you'll thank the Lord that you're here and you're going to get something God has for you. Well, in this text, Jesus is at the house of a Pharisee. And he's been invited uh, there to bake, break bread. And we've talked about this in the past, that how a meal was a major production uh, in the Jewish society. It was a way of you showing hospitality, a time of fellowship, a time of camaraderie. It was considered to be a spiritual experience. And so Jesus used these invitations where people invited him to dinner to turn them into evangelistic and to discipleship opportunities to introduce people to God's kingdom and to strengthen and to further establish people in the word of God as he does here. And so the, one of the first things he does is he teaches a lesson about humility. And that's in Luke chapter 14, verse 7. He says, if you are invited uh, to a wedding feast, don't go in and just assume that the top seat is reserved for you. Some of us are kind of like that. We're just kind of prima donnas by nature. And so we just assume that everybody's here to serve us. And so Jesus says, so enough, you're invited. You just take the back seat and then let them usher you to the front. Now, I know that's why everybody who comes to the church, I know because y'all know the Bible so well and because you are so spiritual, that's why y'all fill the church up at the back first. So y'all get here early so y'all can sit in the back. Because see, if y'all are ushered to the front, then y'all want to wait till God elevates you and promotes you to the front, all right? So I just thought about to tell you this morning that God has given me, uh, deputized me, letting you know it's all right for any of y'all who get here first, you can go ahead and take the front seat. And I promise you that nobody's going to ask you to move back to the back. We believe it first come, first serve, and you're not going to be re re regulated to the back of the bus just because you get here and you take a front seat. But Jesus says, now wait till someone honors you and then let them bring you up to the front seat and then you are being honored. Whereas you take the front seat that was not reserved for you, you can be removed and you can be put back in the cheap seats and then you will be dishonored and embarrassed. So this was just a lesson that he was trying to teach them on the importance of humility. Rather than exalting themselves, let others exalt you. Let others speak well of you. And then in verse 12, he gives them a lesson about generosity. Verse 12, he says, if you are invited, if you are invited, you come to a dinner or supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, you know, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you can be repaid. So Jesus said there are times that we should do things just out of generosity. And there's an old saying that says there's no such thing as true altruism. In other words, the idea is that no one does anything just out of the goodwill of wanting to do it. But Jesus said that shouldn't be the case with Christians. That there are times we should do things just because it's right to do good. And so again, he uses this as an illustration. He said, we're all here eating. We've all been invited to this meal by this big time of Pharisee and our tendency would be when we throw a party to invite the people that's invited us to party. He said, no. Every now and then you ought to throw a party, invite people that could never invite you. And you'd be a blessing to people just because you're in a position to be a blessing to people. Because when we do that, we are emulating the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are two lessons here. One in humility, one in kindness, and in generosity. And then he goes on to say, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Now, this is a different type of social ethic, is it not? We normally don't think about doing things for people who could not do something for us in return because we subscribe to the 11th commandment. You scratch mine, I scratch yours. So we, we subscribe to the 11th commandment. We believe in spiritual reciprocity. 
or in the legal world, they, they, they have a term for it in, in the legal world, and it's this idea of tit for that, tat, this for that, in other words. And so that's what Jesus said, no, we're in a new kingdom now. So the things that we do just out of the kindness and the generosity of our heart, we want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to be done. As a church, we have to understand that we are uniquely called by God to lift our voices and to also lend our resources to help those that I've coined as being the least, the last, the lost, the left out, and the left behind. The people that could never do anything for us in return, at least we could not see how they could do anything for us in return. That's part of our, our lot in life. There was an interesting article this past week in the Charleston Daily Mail newspaper about a lawsuit where the, uh, the Mountain State legal group, they're suing the Western Department of Juvenile S Services for what they describe, or what they're led to be cruel and inhumane punishment of children that's in the correctional institutions of the Western Division of Juvenile Services. And so if you go online to Charleston Daily Mail and read the article from last week, and read the comment section, it is, it's unbelievable what the people in the comment section are saying about uh, the lawsuit. In other words, they're saying they should be treated um, as cruelly as they could be treated. They, they committed a crime. Now I understand that when people commit crimes, they should be held accountable for the crimes that they, they commit. I do understand that. But this is the United States of America. This is not some totalitarian regime here. And so we believe in equal protection under the law. That's somewhere in this document they call the Constitution. And so everybody's supposed to see equal protection of the law. And we also believe that even for people that commit crimes, there is a, a bottom level threshold that we will not allow people to be treated below that level. And it's called cruel and inhumane punishment. We just, we just don't subscribe to cruel and inhumane punishment. There are some people that I think would have cut off their toes and their ears and their noses and their fingers. I mean, for me, but see, that's why God didn't make me the judge. We can't do that and be a civil society because we treat people like they're uncivilized, then we're going to reinforce that they're uncivilized and they're going to act more uncivilized. And so this whole idea of, of trying to at least protect everybody's rights is something that's woven not in the law of the land, but it's also woven in the biblical text about a certain level of humanity that we've got to try to maintain with people other human beings that we've got to live with. And so I was somewhat surprised at how people suggested these children shouldn't have any rights because they committed a crime. Let me tell you why this is important. It doesn't seem to be important. But for years, they've been placing these children in solitary confinement. 23 hours a day in their cell. Not what somebody told me. I was just up there a month ago. And when I walked down the hallway, kids literally came rushing to the bar. bar. They didn't know me from nobody. But they came to the bars because anybody's psyche is affected when they're locked up for 23 hours a day in a cell, particularly young people that are in their teenage years. And they just came and wanted to talk to somebody, anybody that would talk to them because they can't have any conversation during this 23-hour day period, they're out one hour a week to walk around in a cage and out twice a week to take baths and showers. Now, the problem is that according to the Western State Constitution, that's illegal. In West Virginia, we're not supposed to put juveniles in solitary confinement. But the 79 circuit judges didn't seem to know that. The hundreds of prosecuting attorneys didn't seem to know that, nor the hundreds of defense attorneys. So these children have been being put in prosecuting attorney uh, uh, solitary confinement for years. And let me tell you something that you don't know, you know the rest of the story. These are some of the same individuals that come back into our county and our city that's been locked up in solitary confinement on and off during their teen years that commit some of the most violent crimes that are committed in Kanoa County. So that's why these things, we have to pay attention to these type of things. And we can't just conclude that if we uh, subject people to the most harsh punishment, that's going to correct their behavior. That's okay if we're going to lock them up forever, but if we're going to release them at some point in time, we ought to look to try to see if we can connect somewhere to get them to buy into this idea of living under the rule of law. So the things that we do just because we are Christian, 
And so the things we have to pay attention to because we are Christians and we have to be concerned about the least that are among us, the last, the lost, the left out, and the left behind, because if we don't, then no one else will. What Jesus is trying to teach this idea, he talked about the, the halt, the blame, uh, uh, the, the lame, the maimed, the blind. Now, when you invite these type of people to your home or to a confined space, you've got to open the windows, right? And you've got to get out the Febreze, the Lysol, and whatever else. That's just the nature of what you're dealing with. But the idea what he's saying, he's showing here, if there isn't some group of people that are willing to show compassion toward people, then those people fall through the cracks without a living witness of the power of God's love operating through people to love people who appear to be unlovable for the mainstream society. Now, with that as the backdrop, I'm not making this up. This is consistent with the life of Jesus of Nazareth. So we've sanitized Jesus of Nazareth, and we've made him the nice, middle-class, upper-middle-class Jesus. But Jesus w was born in Nazareth of Galilee, which is one of the most despised places of Israel. This was the other side of the track, so much so the word was nothing good could come out of Nazareth, and Nathaniel did not believe it was possible for the Messiah, the anointed one, to come out of Nazareth. So that's where he came from. And so that was his orientation. And so as the Messiah, he was legitimized as being the Messiah because of his compassion for the least that was among them and the fact that he gave them equal access to himself as anyone else. Now, with that as a backdrop, Jesus tells a parable in chapter 14, verse 15. So somebody's sitting there eavesdropping and listening, some uh, sanctified and sanitized person. They say, that's, that's good teaching, Jesus. You know, we, we teach well. It's not our teaching and preaching. It's our doing that comes into question. It's our ability to discharge what we say we believe in real time, in the thoroughfare of life, in the, in the crucible of the society. Can we live our faith out when it's not easy? So he says, that's good teaching. If you're going to help the halt and the maimed and the blind and the poor, he says, that's great. Amen. Blessed to every one of these bread in the kingdom. But then Jesus tells a parable. He says, a certain man, he throws a great supper. He invites many guests. He sends out the servants to those who are invited. He says, come, all things are now ready. Now, this parable really is targeted towards the Jews. Jesus is a Jew. He's teaching a Jewish context. The Jews think that they automatically get into God's kingdom because of their, of their pedigree, because they are Jews, and they don't understand that they got to respond to the gospel. They got to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. So he's telling this parable in this Pharisee's house, surrounded by all these self-righteous Jews, and he says, a man throws a banquet feast he sends out the invitation to all those that were invited. And on the day of the feast, he gets all of these responses. They all, with one accord, begin to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground. He was in the real estate. And so he was a real estate tycoon. But look at his excuse. He says, I have bought a piece of ground, and now i got to go and look at it. Now, what kind of excuse is that? Who in his right mind would buy a piece of ground before they inspected it? Who would buy a house before they went in and looked at the house to see whether there was really a house on the lot, whether there was floors there, whether there was any uh, type of appurtenances there? This is just a flimsy excuse. Just consider me to be excused. I, I, I don't have time. I've, I've got this real estate deal that's going on, and I've got to go look at this piece of ground. Uh, can I be excused? The second one says, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I just bought a brand new car, but I haven't test drove it yet. <laughs> Please consider me excused. Now, Jesus had an incredible sense of humor because what he does, he uses hyperbole and gross exaggeration to make his point. Who in their right mind would buy a yoke of oxen? Oxen were expensive. They were the beast of burden. They were of high priority. They were prized animals to plant and to harvest crops. 
and to drag and carry heavy loads. So five yoke of oxen is an incredible investment. I bought them, but I haven't tried them out yet. Consider me to be excused. So this hyperbole that Jesus uses here, what he's doing is to show that no matter what it is that we are dealing with in life, that when God calls us, we ought to respond to the call of God. That God's call to service, that God's call to salvation, that God's call to engagement, it ought to take precedent over real estate over and over oxen. Now he goes one step further. Verse 20. Still another one said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Why could you just bring her? <laughs> just bring her, and it can be a part of the honeymoon, and y'all can eat a nice meal, and you can just tell her, this feast is all for us. <laughs> this big feast they're throwing, it's just a part of, of the after party. It's just a flimsy excuse. And there are times that we will try to use family responsibility and obligation to excuse ourselves from an invitation to follow Jesus Christ. So Jesus says neither real estate, nor oxen, livestock, property, not even the most intimate of relationship should take precedent over God's invitation to you to come and be his guest at a banquet. Now look at what he does. So he says to the servant that came and reported these things to his master. So the servant comes and he reports to the master, all these people that you invited as your guests, they were on your A-list. I was watching CNN last night and they had the, uh, the National Correspondents Dinner in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're at the big fancy hotel and this is where they bring in all the news reporters and, um, and they kind of have a roast where the president speaks and he shows his comic routine and then they have some other professional uh, a comedian come and give, and I don't know if any of you saw it or not, but it was on CNN last night, and, and the President Obama, he really is funny. He, he can really tell a joke. He has excellent time, and so he was really good in telling the jokes he told and so forth. And then after the situation was over, Ed Lemon, I believe that's his name, uh, he's a correspondent with CNN. He does the weekend stuff on CNN. He, he was a little bit bit out of shape, and the reason he was bit out of shape is because uh, Paris Hilton and Lindy, Lindsay Lohan and Kim Kardashian, they'd all got invited. <laughs> so he wanted to know, how did they get invited? <laughs> how were they invited to the, the, the president's big correspondency? And I could hear what he was saying. What he was really saying was, I got a national TV show on CNN, do serious news every week on Saturday and Sunday. He's on for several hours every day, but I didn't get an invitation. And there Kim Kardashian is, and Lindsay Lohan is, and Paris Hilton. They get it. How did they get invited? And finally, his lady on the show, she kind of calmed him down. She said, well, you know, they got to have the star effect. They got to bring some stars in to create the Hollywood effect. But he, I think he was really somewhat offended that he didn't get an invitation to be there with the president. We've all been given an invitation to dine with the Lord Jesus Christ. And many people basically are spurning this invitation. They're so preoccupied with doing stuff and doing things, they're missing the most exciting adventure, the most exciting journey that they could ever engage in, not in the future, but in the present. To walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, to have his anointing upon your life, to have a sense of God's guidance and God's direction, that God is bearing me along, and to feel like that my life is really counting for something, it's really mattering, mattering, the things that I do, the, the raising of my, of my children, trying to provide a nice, safe place for them, trying to get out here and work in this world we call a jungle, and, and make it, it really matters I do that in a way that is honoring to God, because God is pleased with that. And many people are shunning the invitation. So the master says of the house, being angry, says to his servant, go out and quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. And so this is a direct insult to the Jews. 
who thought that God's kingdom could not move on or be advanced without them. They subscribe to the philosophy that if they don't show up to the party, ain't no party. If they don't show up for the show, there can't be no show. And so what this man says here who's referencing the Lord, he says, no, no, the party's going to go on whether those who are on the original A-list show up or not. And so what Christ is doing here in this text, it is a preview of what's getting ready to happen in the future. Jesus came to the Jews first, and he offered the kingdom to the Jews first. After his death, burial, and resurrection, he anoints the apostles, he gives them the Holy Spirit, and he tells them to go to the Jews first, to go first to the lost sheep of the nation of Israel. But after the nation of Israel has rejected him, they're then instructed to turn to the Gentiles. So we are here today because God decided that he was going to have a party whether the Jews want to come or not. And because the Jews refused to respond to the invitation to come to the banquet feast, he then sent out his servant into the hedges and into the byways to cause those that would come. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a little bit lame when the Lord found me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I don't know about you, I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. As a matter of fact, in my house, you, you seldom could find a spoon that works. Anybody know anything about that? They was already bent up, and you never, I, I didn't know nothing about a place setting, I think, till I was probably in high school, and we went somewhere to a formal deal, and so they gave me this napkin with all of these utensils wrapped up in it, and I unfold this napkin, and all these tools fall out, and I'm saying to myself, what am I supposed to do with this stuff? What am I supposed to do with it? I, I don't see no bicycle to work on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. See, when I was a kid, you, we had no tools. You use a case knife as a screwdriver. You would turn a spoon around backwards if you had to screw something in. I thought these was tools. I didn't know these was eating utensils. In the napkin, well, I thought you put it on yourself like a bib. I didn't know you put it in your lap. See, so that's just where I was coming from. My orientation was like that. So every now and then, I kind of forget. I revert back to my old ways. We'll be at a restaurant. They'll come out. You know, they're getting off a of stender with paper products, you know. It's not come out there and give you one napkin. You got one napkin. You down at Golden Corral. You got ten plates, but you got one napkin. And they'll bring you one napkin. Well, I kind of forget I'm not in Mount Hope, West Virginia. I, I, I forget I'm down here in Charleston, the capital city, so I just start wiping my mouth with the end of my shirt or something like that. And my wife say, wait a minute, hold just for a second. That's what a napkin is for. So I don't know where y'all came from. See, I came from the other side of the track. So I was one of the poor, one of the main, one of the halt. And so I was glad that God found me. As a matter of fact, the Lord had to take me a long way just to find me. But I'm glad that he found me. And so every single week, I'm trying to respond to that invitation. I want to be in somebody's church somewhere, singing the best I can, praying the best I can, praising the best I can, lifting my voice up with the symphony of God's people, testifying, I'm glad that God found me. Or I'm glad that he found me. And so Jesus says to his servants, go out in the hedges and the highways, and you find the halt and the poor and the maimed and the blind and the disfigured, those people who nobody else will invite you anything, you invite them because I want my house to be full. Every now and then, we want to configure the church the way we think it want, should be configured. We want the people to be in church that we think should be in the church. We want our mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, our children, nieces and nephews, aunts and cousins. And that's all a wonderful thing. We should always be trying to evangelize those that have the same bloodline that we have and the same DNA that we have. But after we've done all we can do, we got to reach out to those outside of our bloodline and try to tell somebody about Jesus. There's one thing that we can do that really honors God, and that's to tell people how great God has been to us, how good God has been to us, how God has blessed us, and try to get, to, get somebody to follow us to where we go and worship, testify, Praise and pray together with others of like precious faith as we tell the story of how we've overcome. Well, I'm almost through. Y'all stayed up too late last night. You got to turn that TV off. I keep trying to tell y'all. 
it ain't like it used to be in the old days. In the old days, you could stay up to the TV went off. As a matter of fact, on the weekends, remember when the weekends they'd bring on Hercules? Y'all see Hercules out here in Charleston? Hercules would come on on the weekends after Saturday Night Wrestling went off. That's about 11.30. Then they'd bring on Hercules. And Hercules would be on about an hour and a half, two hours, so about 1.30 or so on the weekends. The TV would go off. They'd bring that funny emblem on there. And the man would come on, they'd play the Star Spangled Banner. And then the brother would come and say, look, we have concluded our broadcast day. We operate on certain, certain frequency. We'll be back on in the morning at 7 o'clock. You can stay up all night looking at the screens you want to. Nothing else is coming on. So we need to go back to that. I wish that I could be president for a day. Head of Federal Communications, I would shut that TV down. Shut the TV down and no later than 12 o'clock. Just shut it down. If you would shut that down, we would cure a lot of problems because people would go to bed. People go to sleep. You know what else? A lot of people's credit wouldn't be so bad either. They sell stuff all night long. <laughs> all night long, they selling stuff. And I know somebody's buying it because they own it every night. So the only way they can afford the TV time, somebody's up late at night calling these people in, giving them their credit card number, buying this one and getting a double this and a triple that. There's somebody going to give you, you know it ain't no good. How they going to solve stuff you one for $9.99, then give you two for $9.99, then do something else in, and all you got to do is play separate shipping and posting. So the item costs $9.95, but the shipping and posting costs $29. <laughs> See, we can shut all that off when we get rid of the TV, but we can't do it because we live in the 21st century. But we ought to be glad that God has blessed us no matter how late we stay up at night on Saturday, we'll get our tired, weary selves up out that bed. Set three or four alarm clocks if necessary. And just set them all over the house so they just go off everywhere. So you got to get up and go shut them all down. And by the time you walk in every room shutting off an alarm clock, you'll be awoke. You'll be awake. And you say, I might as well go on to church because I'm up. Verse 23, I'm, I'm done. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. One of the sad things is there are some people that live close to the church never find their way there. Never hear the story how Jesus hung, bled, and died and was buried and raised from the dead. They never hear that story. They never put their faith in Jesus Christ. And they just assume they're going to get into heaven on their mama's prayers, on their grandmama's prayers, because somebody prayed for them, and they're not going to taste that supper. I, I, I don't know about you, but you know, one driving force in my life is to get to heaven and try to get as many people to go as I can. And try to get as many people to accompany me to go on this journey as possible. So I want to encourage all of you and challenge all of you as you look around and look in your sphere of influence. Look at the people that you know, the people that you work with friends and relatives and neighbors and start reaching out to them and telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ and how God is blessing you and what God means to you and try to encourage them to follow you to church where you are nurtured and where you are encouraged in the name of the Lord. I believe that God will be pleased with that. And we just do the best that we can to reach out to people. At the end of the day, many people simply are not going to be saved. And for those of y'all who don't like a whole lot of people, well, you certainly want to go to heaven. Because there's not going to be a whole lot there. It's going to be few that hear and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. And you ought to be glad that you're one that responds. And you ought to be so glad that you try to tell as many people as you possibly can. You know, when you go into these big cities and you see how many people there are moving, pushing and pressing and, and so forth. You say, wow. I wonder, how many of those people even thinking about the Lord? How many of those people got any concern about their future or where they're headed? And all I can think about is, Lord, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for saving me. You know, I was in the, in the train 
in like Chicago, like at the rush hour, you get on the train and they're just packed. I mean, there's people just on top of each other, just packed into the train. And you got to like almost knock people off to get off because you only got a certain amount of time. They close them doors. You know, those doors gonna close. You can't. You got to go up at the next stop. And I just watch just how impersonal the people are. People don't even look at each other. They're just stepping over each other, bumping each other, and don't even want to make contact, eye contact. Because that would suggest that I ought to show you a courtesy. Because you're a human being just like me. And looking at that, I couldn't help but think, Lord, how many people are going to make it in? How many are going to make it in? And so as I come on back to where I belong, Charleston, West Virginia, I say, Lord, help me to be more faithful and more committed to try to convince people seriously think about the relationship with Jesus Christ. And I invite you to join me on that journey. There's something that only we can do, and that is bear witness by our lifestyle and with our words that we believe that Jesus Christ really is alive. He has changed our life, and that he's working in our lives, and we're so excited about it, we've got to tell others about it. Amen? Let's pray together, shall we?